We're just excited for John. So stretch your hands out to this man and bless him. Say, Father, I thank you that he, as he opens his mouth, you fill it with good things. And we thank you for the message that just draws us closer to this man, Jesus, that we love, that we serve, that we honor. And so we bless you, John, as you deliver the word, as you release the goodness of God to us tonight. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Great. Well, it's good to be with you guys. Worship was fun, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, yes, good. <laughs> it was great. So good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for bringing us in. Well, I'm going to be talking tonight about being made in the image of God. And I couldn't fail to start tonight without talking about my newborn son. Oh, I hear a few R's. Hey. I have a son who is 11 weeks old. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd also like to say that uh, last night he slept from 10.30 until 6.20. For any of you that have experienced newborns, that is a feat right there. So uh, Alice and I are feeling very blessed. That sweet little boy is made in my image. If you come up to me afterwards, I can show you a picture of me when I was a baby and my son when he, well, now, because he is a baby, obviously. The, the, uh, the similarity is uncanny. You'd think that we were related or something. The kid looks like me. He looks like me. Not now, obviously. He has time to mature into this handsome, rugged exterior. But, but as a baby, he looks just like I did as a baby. Because he bears my image. You guys all know the reason for that, because he carries my DNA, right? It's half my DNA, half my wife's DNA. But he's made in my image. And you know, through, through me, his dad, through his mom, and through his other dad, he's going to find his identity in life. We're going to impart to him over these years his sense of identity. We're going to speak over him who he is. We're going to speak love over him every day. We're going to tell him, you're amazing, that you're called, you're chosen, that you're made for big things, that you're made to be in relationship with God. We're going to keep speaking these things. We're going to keep affirming him again and again and again. Right, parents? Good. And in doing that, we're going to give him identity. And as we show him who the father is, the father is going to start speaking to him and is going to speak his identity into him. And as he gains a sense of his identity, he's going to find his calling. So that as he sails into adult life, it's not that he's going to have everything figured out right away, but he's going to have a good sense of who he is in life and a real understanding of what he's made for. But tonight I want to blow this up onto more eternal universe kind of level. Can I do that? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. If we were to boil down the Bible, this wonderful book, I mean, this is a thin line version, so it's, uh, it's nice and slim. But, you know, I have one of those family Bibles at home. It's from 1918, uh, I think. Yeah, it's pretty old. And it's like this thick, and it weighs a lot. And I'm really glad they didn't weigh my hand luggage when I brought it back from England with me. <laughs> Because it weighs quite a lot. But if we were to boil down this book, this good book, into its core components, what is the message of the Bible? If we were to boil it right down, if I said, hey, I don't know anything about this Bible, I don't know anything about Christianity, explain it to me in like four easy to understand points. Here's what we'd probably say. Well, okay, it starts with creation. God makes the heavens, he makes the earth, he makes the animals, he makes man. So that's the first thing, creation. And then it all goes kind of south after that, right? We have the fall. Uh, more about that later. And then, so we've, we've, we've got through the first few pages of the Bible. Then we're going to skip about two-thirds of the Bible and hit the Gospels. And we'd say, 
you know, so man walked away from God and rebelled against God, and there was the fall. So that's the second point. And then the third one is we'll skip ahead a long way, and we have Jesus. Now, Jesus is God. He's the Son of God. And if I didn't know anything about Christianity, that might be a hard one to explain. But you say, okay, well, there's the Trinity. There's God the Father, Son, and God Holy Spirit, okay? And God the Father sends Jesus to come and die for us, live a perfect life, die for us, and save us from our sins. Yes? So I've got creation. I've got fall. I've got this message of redemption through Jesus on the cross. And then the last thing I would say is, and then you get to spend eternity with him. Heaven would be my last one, right? Well, this is a very, very uh, simple way to boil this down. And I think John 3.16 plays a massive part in building that kind of wham-bam condensed version of the Bible, right? Right? You guys all remember John 3.16? For God. That was quite pathetic, guys. I mean, if anyone needs to get saved and doesn't know Jesus tonight and hasn't read their Bible, then you're completely off the hook tonight, okay? Um, But for those of you that have been in Sunday school week after week as a child and have just heard that verse a million times, I need need a bit more from you tonight, okay? Is that okay? So, all together, for God... Very good. Is that a good message? Excellent. Well... That passage is super foundational in building our theology in church. But here's what I want to explore tonight. Whilst that passage is wonderful, beautiful, and has saved millions of lives and given uh, a clear understanding of salvation, it's not a full representation of God's plan for mankind. I can see a few worried faces... That's okay, bear with me. I'm now going to say something which might make even more of you concerned. There is more to life than getting saved and going to heaven. Are you with me tonight? Okay, nice. Before you get any funny ideas about whether I'm even still saved, let me tell you what I think about salvation. I believe that there is only one way to come to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ, through his perfect sinless life, through his death on the cross. He is the only way. And I believe the Bible, and it says that we have to believe in him to gain salvation. I do believe that people are going to reject the offer that he gives of reconciliation and they're going to spend an eternity without him. I believe that. But the cross means more for us than just salvation from hell. If the cross is the defining moment of history, where the perfect intersection where God really comes and intervenes with man and makes a statement, it's really worth examining, right? It's really worth examining. We need to dig into this and what it implies about the way we're meant to live our lives. But I believe a lot of thinking in the world and sometimes in the church teaches us to think that our hope as Christians is to escape from the darkness and head to heaven. How many of you have seen that? How many of you have seen it in society? You've seen it on... You know, what people say about Christians, like, oh, you know, they just want to, you know, they're they're sick of, you know, worldly people. They're sick of people doing stuff that, you know, isn't the way they want it to go. And they just, they just want to be in heaven sitting on a fluffy cloud. Anyone know the fluffy cloud theology? Sitting on a fluffy cloud playing a harp? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. You've seen those cartoons and stuff. But there's more to it. 
The New Testament is really clear. When you read it, the New Testament is super clear. Our destination, our, our final destination is not heaven. It's not. Heaven is a very temporary thing. What God talks about in Revelation is a new heaven and a new earth. And just as Adam was put on the earth, and this whole cycle has played out, so we are called in our resurrection bodies, in our resurrected bodies, we're going to be walking on the new earth. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven and earth are going to intersect. And we're going to be there. Does that sound like fun? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of people like, yeah, maybe, maybe that sounds fun. Okay, let me give you a bit more convincing. God is concerned about bringing his goodness to bear upon his creation. That is his concern. That's what he's interested in. That's what he's always been interested in. It's bringing his nature, his character, and bringing it to bear upon his creation, upon earth. And we are his creation. This is his creation And he's super concerned about this place. He cares so deeply about this place. He cares about you here in this room. He's caring about the people down the street at the bars. He's caring about the whole Toronto. And he's really concerned about bringing his goodness to bear upon this earth. So whilst the cross remains fundamentally important to my life, I view it not as solely to have its function as for me to escape punishment. But rather the cross, what it invites me into is to live a life that is fully human in the way that God intended me to be. God is inviting me to be fully human, fully alive. And he's inviting you too. And so we come to this, that we're made in the image of God. We're called to be image bearers of God on this planet. As I said, that God is concerned in bringing his goodness and bringing it to bear on earth. He makes us in his image. And what he's concerned about is having us reflect him here and in the age to come on the new earth to represent him. So if there is more at stake than just escaping punishment, we need to go, we need to look at the whole story. So if we go back to the creation story, Genesis 1, if you have your Bibles, you can go there. Genesis 1, we're going to start at uh, verse 26. God has looked out over the Expanse of nothing, and he said, you know what? I've got an idea today. We're going to make some things. And so he creates all the world around us. He makes the waters, the skies. He starts making trees, animals, fish, birds. And then he gets here. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on over the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with its seed and fruit, for you shall have them for food. And every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is a great image. 
I don't know about you, but I like this image. As I see it, there are three things in this image. There is paradise. Yes, please. There is love because God created man and woman. And there is vocation. There is calling. There is a mission. Let me tell you about a little dream of mine that would have those things. My dream would be to live in the most gorgeous place on earth. It's in England, obviously. It's called the Lake District. It's in the north of England. Beautiful place, just beautiful. I'm gonna spend two weeks there this summer and I cannot wait. I would live there, it's a place of, uh, well, by Canadian standards, I wouldn't really call them mountains, but let's call them big hills, shall we? Because, you know, we don't actually technically have anything over a thousand meters in England, but they're beautiful anyway. So we have our mini mountains. There's beautiful lakes, hence it being called the Lake District. We're pretty smart, the English people. And just beautiful, like, stone cottages here and there. Little winding lanes, fluffy little sheep. It's just a very picturesque place. It's my favorite place to be. I haven't found anywhere that beats it yet. I'm sure you have your own place, which you think is the most delightful place to be. For me, it's this place. So here's my dream, that I would live there in the most gorgeous place that I've found. I would be there with my family, my lovely wife, my son, and maybe any other kids that we might have. And then my vocation. Let's come to my vocation. What would my calling be? Jonathan, I hear you say, surely you can only conceive of strumming your guitar and singing worship songs to the Lord. Well, yes, but next on my list would be to be a park ranger. That's right, everybody. I would love to be a park ranger. I would love just to wear shorts all year round and to be hiking through the hills, setting up fences and checking on the fish in the little tarns, the little lakes on the mountains. I think that would be a great job. Anyone else? I've got a couple of people that are going to come with me. Excellent. Walter, we'll do it together. That would be my dream. But you know what? Reading Genesis 1 and 2, I think that sounds pretty nice as well. In paradise... Adam's got this gorgeous wife that God gives to him. He's got a really cushy job. You have to name the animals. And you have to get the fruit and get the produce off the land. Which at that point was kind of like, it was throwing itself at Adam and Eve. It was like, hi, I'm an apple tree. Have some apples, please. Have some apples. And, you know, uh, there's a pumpkin patch. Oh, yes, yes. We're just in season whenever you want. You know, it would be a beautiful garden. And the best bit of all, God comes and walks in the cool of the day with them. It sounds beautiful. I love this concept. And then it all goes wrong. Adam, it all goes wrong. We have the most beautiful destiny lined up, guys. I don't know how many of you have been as unhealed in your hearts as me and have sometimes thought, Adam, if you hadn't ruined this for the rest of us, we would have just lived in you know, perfect peace for all eternity in Eden? Anyone else? Anyone else thought that? I'm like, come on, Adam. Seriously? You messed this up for all of us. Now, if we really get into it, there is a reason why he did it. And for true love to really exist, there has to be free will. And so Adam had to actually be able to exercise his free will. And he had to be able to be tempted. And he had to be able to make a decision. But seriously, man, come on. I would have liked that. I really would have liked that. Just naming animals in the afternoon, go for a walk with God, chill out with my wife. Sounds like the good life. But we can't get hung up on the fall because Genesis 1 and 2 is not to do with the fall. Genesis 1 and 2 is about creation. It's about the creation of man. In that whole Eden story, it's chapter 3 where it goes wrong, but 1 and 2 is setting us up for really what we're meant to be doing. 
the story of Eden is not just about punishment and banishment from paradise. It's giving us the blueprint of what we're designed to be as humans. But, you know, we get really hung up with this idea of punishment. It's in every religion, this idea of, like, getting it wrong, atonement. It's very much in our culture, punishment. If you do something wrong, there is consequence. We see it everywhere. It's all around us. And so it's pretty natural for us when we're reading a story to really jump on it and be like, aha, this is the point. This is the point right here. It's about getting stuff wrong and punishment. But we just have to rewind. We have to go back from Genesis 3, and we have to go back to Genesis 1 and 2 and work out, well, what was this all about in the first place? I want to tell you a little story. When I was probably about nine me and my sister didn't get on particularly well. Sometimes she did some things which annoyed me. And good little boy that I was, I was just totally sweet to her the whole time. No. I was pretty cheeky to her. So one time she annoys me in a way that I thought was punishable. My nine-year-old vengeance came up to the surface so I crafted myself a weapon. I got a pen. It's like one of those uh, kids' felt pens that has, they, they color in with. And I tied it to a piece of rope that I got from a magic set for Christmas. And I swung it around and I thought, this is a fantastic weapon. I can assail my sister with this weapon. And so I come out of my bedroom onto the landing, and I'm standing there swinging my weapon, my newfound weapon of glory, and I am ready to give her what for. I am ready to show her you shouldn't mess with me. I'm a serious man, serious business. And so carefully swinging this weapon of choice, I knock on her door and wait and wait I'm like, hurry up, answer the door. Why? I've got something for you. She opens the door. I look. I swing. I launch. I miss. She says, what were you doing? I was like, uh, nothing. Trying to cover my tracks. And she steps out of her bedroom and looks around the whole landing. and just looks in kind of this arc. And I follow her gaze. <gasps> the pen didn't have a lid on. It was a red marker. It left a little dot of red on every swing. And I've been standing there for minutes, swinging and swinging leaving not hundreds, but thousands of tiny red dots. My parents' house suddenly had measles. <laughs> well, that backfired, didn't it? In uncontrollable tears, I confessed to my parents and waited for punishment. Because I knew I was wrong. I knew I was in the wrong. Couldn't really wiggle my way out of this one. Couldn't really figure out a way to pin it on her. And anyway, I was feeling pretty guilty about this. And so I owned up to it. And with great tears, <gasps> I'm so sorry, I, just, I, just, I don't know why I did it, but I did it. I just, I just picked up the pen and I tied it up and I was thinking, I mean, and it just went on like that. I didn't mean to, but I just, I just wanted to hit her. I mean, I didn't want to hit her, but I just wanted to hit her. And my parents patiently listened to this babbling mess. And I waited for judgment to be given. 
Now, I don't know about you. I don't know what kind of family you came from. If your parents here, I'm not sure what kind of punishment you would deal out for such an offense. But here is what my parents said to me. We can see that you're really sorry about this. You're forgiven. Sorry? Can you, can you just repeat that? Maybe could you write that down for future reference, just in case I need to bring that? I'm, I'm not punished at all? No. You've, you've actually been, you're, you're quite mortified and upset about this. So that's going to be the punishment in itself. <gasps> anyway, I knew about justice. Little boys have an understanding of justice, let me tell you. I played plenty of... Uh, plenty of uh, games about bad people and good people. I knew about justice. I knew how justice had to be dealt out. But in that moment, I was confused. Now, this story is on a different scale to Adam and Eve in the garden and their sin. But this is the point I want to make with this story. The aim of the father is not to go around dealing out punishment. That's not his goal. In the end, punishment did have to get dealt out. And in the end, God in his mercy put it all on Jesus. But we're looking for punishment. And let me tell you that God is looking for reconciliation. He's looking for a heart. Every time, he's looking for a heart. He's looking for a heart that is repentant and that is turned towards him. When a heart is turned towards him, he'll receive it. When a heart is turned towards him, he'll receive it. In that moment with my parents, I was pretty miserable about it, but my heart turned towards my parents. There wasn't an ounce in me of rebellion and anger towards them in that moment. It was complete contrition, and I'm sorry. And what they extended to me was grace. Grace. Because the parent, what they're concerned about is reconciliation with the child, right? They're concerned about the posture of the heart of the child. And God the Father is no different. He's clearly a father. He's described as a father in the Old Testament. He's called Abba Father by Jesus in the New Testament. The picture we have of him is a father. And the punishment went to Jesus what he's concerned about is reconciliation and our hearts being turned towards him. Genesis 1 and 2 tells us this, that we are made in the image of God. That we are made to create. And that we are made to rule. These feel pretty lofty to me. I'm not sure where we're all at tonight. I don't know what you've been taught before. If you've been here on Friday nights, hopefully you've been taught really good stuff. <laughs> but if there is any hint of a belief in you that you've got to work to get back into God's good books, let me tell you the best news tonight is that God has gone completely above and beyond, out of his way, over the top, just incredible distances to make sure that you can be reconciled to him. He's done absolutely everything. What we have to do is turn our hearts back towards him. That's all we have to do. If you feel at all like you have to earn it, let me challenge you to rethink that. Because you are made in his image in his image, you are made to create just like he creates, and you are made to rule just like he rules. In this moment, in Genesis 1 and 2, we are given both identity and calling. Both identity and calling. So our identity, we are made for relationship with him, right? Right? 
This is such good news, such good news. What we truly believe is that the Bible outlines for us that God is not a distant God, that He is intimately acquainted with us. Read through Psalm 139, and I dare you to try and tell me after reading that, that God is not deeply concerned with everything that's going on. It's a beautiful picture of His passion and the intimacy with which He handles us. Our identity, we're made for relationship with God. We're also made to do the will of God. Jesus set this out for us. When asked about food, Jesus said, my food, the stuff that feeds me, the way I really get satisfied, John 4, 34, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. We were made to do the will of God. And the New Testament clearly outlines some roles that we, as these reconciled children, as if before the fall, here's what we're made to fulfill. We're meant to be in relationship with the Father. We're meant to be born of the Spirit and not of the flesh. We're born to be temples of the Holy Spirit. We're born into being priests and kings. These are pretty great titles, right? Pretty great titles. I think you guys should smile about that tonight because I think it's pretty good news, right? It's pretty good news. Made to be priests and kings. This is our identity. This is what God has given us. We're made to be in relationship with the Father, calling him Abba, Daddy. We are born of the Spirit, not of the flesh. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. God dwells on the inside of me. The Old Testament is absolutely full of temple imagery where God comes to meet with man, but he meets in places of stone, cold, hard stone, where a priest goes in to minister before the Lord and hopes that he gets out alive. <laughs> That's where God meets with man. But it's interesting in the Old Testament, end of the Old Testament, talks about taking out a heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh. If we think of the heart of like the, the emotional connection, the resting place of love, well, that temple imagery in the Old Testament where God dwelt in temples made of stone has now become temples made of flesh in our hearts, in us. The Holy Spirit is dwelling on the inside of me, the Holy Spirit is dwelling on the inside of you, and if he's not, I'm going to give you a chance for that to happen tonight. We're priests. Peter talks about this. Priesthood of all believers, for you are a royal priesthood. You know, Jesus is our high priest, and we are priests serving with him. We minister to the Lord. And you know that you are made in uniqueness. This is part of your identity. You're made in uniqueness. So I want you to consider that there is a part of God's heart that only you will ever touch because it was with an original thought that he planned you because no one else has your DNA, no one else has your fingerprints, no one else has your eyes, no one else has your voice print. You are made in uniqueness by a God of creation. And so therefore there was a thought in his mind and in his heart that went specifically to you and just to you which means that there is a place in his heart which is only going to be reached by your affection, by your love, by the way that you posture your heart towards him. That is a beautiful calling. We're called to be priests, ministering to God and ministering to this earth, ministering to other believers, ministering to this world that doesn't know him yet. And we're called to be kings. We're called to be kings. In both old and and New Testament, there's a lot of talk about kings. Jesus is the king of kings. He has the capital K. We get the little K. We are kings. We're called to this 
uh, dominion mandate to this ruling mandate. That's what God is asking of us. There's so much in the scripture about you being given stuff to steward, to run with. One of the most beautiful illustrations of God's happiness to let flawed humans run with things is to look at the lives of the disciples. The disciples are the craziest bunch of men and the weirdest pick for apostles. I mean, these guys are not suitable, really. If you read through the, uh, if you read through the New Testament, I would not pick these guys. Really, I would not pick these guys. I would pick guys that were like very mature. You know? I would have gone straight probably for the Pharisees and the Sadducees, tried to find the ones that weren't too religious, and you know, tried to like pull some of the religion out of them because they already behaved nicely, right? They already knew how to pray. They already knew uh, how to behave. They knew social etiquette. Um, You know, I would pick some people that kind of looked good. The disciples, I mean, I'm amazed that Jesus wasn't, wasn't worried that the disciples would make him look bad because they behaved terribly. Peter's denying him. He's saying stuff where Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. I mean, that's pretty serious stuff, really, isn't it? We've got brothers that are fighting about who's going to be the greatest. I mean, Jesus is giving top-notch sermons. I mean, you probably are all thinking that I'm, you know, I'm preaching just an amazing sermon tonight and... And, you know, how could Jesus possibly have preached a better sermon? But I'm sure they were better, really. I'm sure they were better. And the disciples got these sermons probably day after day, and Jesus is pouring into them. And, you know, when you read the passage, Jesus just finished talking to them about something, and then he finds out that James and John are arguing about who's the greatest and who's going to sit next to him. Guys, pull yourselves together. And then we've got Thomas, who's like, um, yeah, um... I, I don't know if I believe, actually, that you could be raised from the dead because I've never seen any resurrections before. Oh, wait, no, I have seen resurrections before. <laughs> it's amazing that he wouldn't believe. The lack of faith in that guy is just outstanding. This would not be my pick. And yet, and yet, Jesus picks them. Jesus created an environment around him where a Judas could still have a place. Now there is trust. So if you are ever thinking, I don't know if I'm qualified to be doing kingdom stuff, I want you just to think about the disciples, their woeful lack of uh, good behavior, and just think, you know what? I might do an all right job. So these things being a temple of the Holy Spirit, being priests, being kings. This is our identity. This is our identity. This is what God has spoken over us. It's what he speaks into our lives right now. It's what I'm speaking over you tonight, that you are temples of the Holy Spirit, that you are priests, that you are kings. This is our identity, and that you are sons and daughters of the Most High God. If that's our identity, that is the place from which we get our calling. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, with the term vocation. Vocation is like a strong feeling of suitability for a particular career or occupation. Or it can be a function or station in life to which one is called by, by God. Vocation is that, is that strong pull. This is what I'm made for. This is what I'm, what I'm going to do. People talk about vocation, you know, when people do very self-sacrificing jobs. When someone is a nurse, that is a super hard job. That's a vocation. If someone's driven to do that, I just want to provide care for people. I want to do some of the stuff which isn't that romantic and glamorous, but it's serving people. That's a vocation. Our vocation. In the beginning, let's go back, Genesis 1 and 2. Our calling is to be sons and rulers, to walk with the Father and to subdue the earth and steward it. In the New Testament, it gets fleshed out for us a bit more. Our calling, our vocation, we're to walk as sons and priests and kings. Sons and priests and kings. 
you know, I talk to uh, a lot of young people. We have a school of ministry here, um, and often talking to those students, talking to young adults here in our church community, and there is one big question that happens in every young adult, and I probably think it happens in older people as well. I mean, I talk to my parents, and they're like, what are we going to do with our lives? But that is the question. What am I going to do with my life? How many of you ask the question, what shall I do when I grow up? How many of you are still asking that question? What am I going to do, really, when I grow up? It's a massive question in our society. People are desperate to find their groove, their niche, the thing that they were made for. You know, we might find a very clear mandate from God that we'd be able to put our finger and say, yes, this is clearly the mandate. Uh, In England, there was just a general election. Theresa May looks like she's going to form a government. wasn't a majority, so she's going to have to form with another party. But she is going to be the Prime Minister of England again. She already was, but she looks like she's going to continue being Prime Minister after this election. If you ended up being the Prime Minister of England or of Canada or the President of the United States, how many of you think that would be quite a highlight of career? I mean, it really doesn't get much bigger than that, does it? Donald Trump at the moment, do you think he has any aspirations which he think are loftier than being president of the United States? I don't know, maybe he wants to be president of the world, I don't know, but... At the moment, president of the United States, that's about as as high as he's going to go. And whilst some of us are going to hit points like that where, you know, we're going to get job titles which are really like, you know what, this is... I can put them, you know, I can put a marker in this. This is clearly a vocation. This is clearly what God has prepared me for. Whilst some of us will get those, some of us might not. And it might be more subtle things. But I tell you that our calling is universal as believers, is to be sons and to be priests and to be kings on this earth and on the earth to come. It's to be sons, to be priests, and to be kings. We find out our calling, we find out our vocation through identity as God's image bearers. I want to go back to this this false idea that Christianity is all about escaping to heaven. There's good reason why we might come to this conclusion. Philippians 3.20 says, We are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return to earth as our Savior. When Paul's writing this, Paul is writing to um, to the church in Philippi, and when he's writing this and saying, We are citizens of heaven, we have to, we kind of have to rewind a little bit. We have to grab the Bible and we have to put it in some context. Because that would be a tempting scripture to take and say, Paul is saying that we are citizens of heaven, therefore heaven is our resting place. But if we rewind, if we look at what Paul was talking about in the context of him in his community, Paul was a Roman citizen and he was proud of being a Roman citizen because he got treated a bit nicer because he was a Roman citizen. Do you remember when they uh, beat Paul and he said, hang on a moment, I'm a Roman citizen. Do you remember what it says then? The guards were a bit afraid. They're like, oh, shouldn't have done that. Should not have done that. Because Roman citizens uh, deserve to be treated a bit better. So Paul, when he's talking about citizenship, he's talking about in reference to being a citizen of Rome. Now, in the Roman Empire, you know that uh, the Roman Empire was governed from Rome, but stretched out a long way, stretched out a long way down to Africa, up through Europe, up into the British Isles, all across Europe. Big empire. The goal of being a Roman citizen was not to live in Rome. The goal of being a Roman citizen was to bring the culture bring the vision and the values of Rome and to superimpose them and apply them to the place where you were. 
So when Paul is talking about being a citizen of heaven, he's not actually saying, this is where we all ought to be right now. What he's saying is, being a citizen of heaven is carrying the values of heaven. Carrying the values of the kingdom, where the king is, and bringing them to bear upon earth. Just like apostles Apostles in the New Testament, you know, if you hear people speak now on what is an apostle, it seems to be the least defined of the five-fold ministry, right? If you ask 10 people, what does apostle mean? You'll get 10 different answers. But what you get when, you know, in, in the, at the time where the early church was, the context of apostle was being a messenger, being an ambassador. It could refer to an army. It could refer to a fleet, it could refer to an emissary, but what it is, is it's people carrying the vision and values. So even apostleship, it's all about bringing culture. It's all about bringing what you have and bringing it to bear upon where you're going. And so the truth is that we are called to bring heaven and the culture of heaven, and bring it to bear upon earth. And as sons and priests and kings, that's what we're called to. That's our mandate, is to bring heaven onto earth. You're made in the image of God. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell them, you're made in the image of God. And tell them as well, I'm made in the image of God. This is our most beautiful calling, is to be image bearers. Is to be image bearers. So this is my final encouragement tonight. There's this thing called the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is quite a mouthful, so I'll say it again. The Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it was a group of very wise fathers in the faith that got together and, and tried to work out what is the chief end of man. And this gets referenced quite a lot, so you've probably heard it before. But they came after much deliberation and decided if we were to boil down what man is for, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And you know, we fulfill our calling when we recognize the origin of every good and perfect thing that comes across our path and we reflect it back to the giver of good gifts. We fulfill our calling when we revel in the love and the glory of God that He has given us. We fulfill our calling when we choose to accept that we're made in His image and we reflect who He is upon the earth. And I love this verse. We're going to end with this verse, Philippians 4. Starting at uh, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I love this passage because to me it just smells like the character of God. If I'm made in the image of God, I'm called to reflect who He is. I'm called to walk in my vocation as a son and as a priest and a king. 
And as I am in the image of God, everything that is lovely, everything that is pure, whatever's just, whatever's honorable, whatever's true, whatever's commendable, excuse me, anything that's excellent and worthy of praise, I'm going to dwell on these things. I'm going to speak of it. I'm going to shout of it. I'm going to sing of it. Can we have the worship team back up? And I want to pray tonight because I had this sense from God that some of us, um, some of us really struggle with this identity thing. What am I called to? Where is my place? Where do I fit in to this narrative? The truth is, is that we do fit. Each one of us, whether you feel like it or not, there's place. Whether you feel like it or not, there's been set out key things for us to be getting on with. So I'm going to get you guys to stand and we're going to pray together. Father, tonight we just want to, we want to come before you. And God, we're so thankful for the identity that you've spoken over us. Thank you, God, that you've called us your beloved. Thank you that you've called us sons and daughters. God, I thank you that you call us your friend. God, I thank you that you call us priests, a priesthood of all believers. You've called us a royal priesthood. God, I thank you that we were made to minister to your heart, to reach places of your heart that no other person's ever going to touch. God, I thank you that we're called to minister to this world to love it, to love the people of this world, to treat them with dignity and honor, to bring them into the revelation of who you are. God, I thank you that we are made as kings. I thank you for the incredible trust that you put in us for the incredible faith that you put in us. I thank you that you will accomplish all you want to through us by your grace. And tonight, God, we just want to repent for anywhere where we haven't lived in that place of sonship or of being a priest or of being a king. God, where we've lived like orphans, we repent. God, where we haven't been priests, we repent. God, where we've abdicated the throne of being king and a ruler, being an influencer, God, we're sorry for that. And tonight, Lord, we're asking for the fullness. We're asking for another layer to be lifted in our hearts, for another layer to be lifted off in our understanding, that we would see what you've made us to be clearer. God, just as you've spoken the identity over us, I thank you that you've called us to walk upon this earth and to bring heaven to bear upon earth. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Can I invite the ministry team up? I'm going to do a few calls for different things. 
first off, I want to do a call for uh, anyone in here who they've been desperate just to escape, just to escape. You might be dealing with depression or anxiety, but really you just, you want to get out of here and you want to just go and be with Jesus and be uh, in heaven. I feel like God's saying, uh, some people in this room, there's been that escape mentality, like I've just kind of had enough. I just need to get out. If that's you, if you've been struggling that season, I want to invite you to come forward. We've got an amazing prayer ministry team who are going to be ministering to you. If that's you, if you feel like, ah, I've just been having such a hard time and it just would be easier to escape just to go and be in heaven. We want breakthrough tonight for you. Because the truth is, we are made to bring heaven to bear upon earth. We are made to bring heaven to bear upon earth. So if that's you, I just encourage you, come and get some prayer tonight. The second thing I want to um, encourage you guys if you want to respond to, I felt like the Lord saying, some people are saying, I have absolutely no idea what my calling is. I want to be a faithful Christian and I've been following the Lord and maybe you've been following the Lord for years, but you still feel like it's very unclear, like what direction am I going? What's my calling? What's my purpose? And I feel like the Holy Spirit is just going to bring a fresh revelation tonight of your calling as a son, as a priest, as a king. So if that's you tonight, if you've just been wrestling with that, I'm not sure what my calling is. I want to invite you, come. Come now. Come and receive. Because the Father is coming to speak identity. He's coming to speak destiny. He's coming to speak purpose tonight. made for purpose made for purpose yeah ministry team you can just feel free to go and pray for these guys this is good guys this is good we love doing this we love just being in God's presence and just praying whatever he leads us to pray so I just want to encourage you, keep your eyes fixed on Him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The last thing I want to um, just get you guys to respond to is I had the feeling that um, some people are really struggling with the fact that they're made in the image of God and image and identity has been a, a real challenge for you and if you've been dealing with you know any like self-loathing self-hatred anything like that or even if it's just like I, I really don't know if I'm really made in his image if you want to get some prayer tonight for that, we really want to encourage you come and come and receive tonight. But let's just all pray together, and I want to encourage you. Let's just get uh, put your hand on a on a person of a shoulder next to you. I want to make sure that everyone gets ministered to tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your work with us. Thank you that you're, you, you're making us new. You make all things new. Thank you that you're bringing us back to our original calling, our original purpose tonight. Father, we're just asking that unbelief would be lifted tonight. Father, we're asking that your words of truth would be spoken tonight. Cool. God, I'm asking that there would be such an excitement in our hearts of the vocation, the calling that, you're, that you have in front of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit.
Thank you, Holy Spirit.